So um, my name is Tim Lockie. I'm sorry we had a couple of uh, the inevitable IT issues um, with this, no matter how much preparation the uh, team um, had put into this, which was very impressive. I'd like to thank George and everyone in the back office. Uh, um, lots of careful support and everything. Um, we are meant to have a chair, but unfortunately she's not able to actually join for some reason. So I'm going to kick off. My name is Tim Lockie. I'm a consultant cardiologist at the Royal Free. Um, and this is a cross-site service, not just um, Royal Free, of course. We have other very important institutions within our group, including a Barnet, Chase Farm, Finchley, Edgware, um, and various other community clinics that we'll discuss later. Um, it's my great pleasure to present the heart failure team at the Royal Free, who have been carrying out some incredibly innovative and really in many ways life-changing work in the last few years. I think for, many, for a long time, heart failure had sort of been the result of many cardiac problems. And there was, once you got to that, it was a kind of a spiral downhill. And there wasn't really much you could do other than just very, very basic treatment that hadn't changed for about 20 years. So there've been some real innovations in the last few years. And many of these have genuinely been kind of total game changers for our patients. And we're seeing it both in terms of improvement in symptoms, reduction in hospital stay, um, in terms of their reducing the risk of them bouncing back into hospital and leading a good independent quality of life, which is what we're all here for. So, um, but obviously in order to deliver these treatments, we need a fantastic team and we need diagnostics, we need support um, and we need the appropriate setup to do that. And that's what we're going to be talking a little bit about today, both at Royal Free and across the group. And um, I'm delighted to have Carol Whelan and Amit Mackay, who are two of our senior cardiologists who head up the service to talk through some of their um, work they've been doing. So can we have the next slide, please, George? So to put all of this into context, um, heart failure isn't a diagnosis in, it such, in itself in the fact that it can be due to a whole variety of different causes, but it really describes a syndrome or a constellation of symptoms and clinical findings that can result from any structural or functional cardiac disorder that impairs the pumping ability of the heart. Remember that at the end of the day, the heart is an engine. It pumps blood to all the vital organs in our body. And if the pump doesn't work, then our bodies are in serious trouble. And there are many, many causes for heart failure, but the end syndrome, unfortunately, is a very, very difficult one to manage and can be incredibly debilitating, causing huge morbidity and mortality in the country. It affects almost a million people in the UK. Can you keep going, please? Next slide. And as I said, it can be due to a whole variety of causes. The One of the commonest causes, at least in this country, is ischemic heart disease or blockages in the heart arteries, causing heart attacks and damage to the heart as a result of that. Now, there have been lots of kind of innovations that we've managed um, to improve that. And we're, we're certainly, we perform very, very well in the UK now with our kind of joined up healthcare service. It lends itself very well to getting rapid and quick treatment, but there's still a huge amount of morbidity related to blockages in the heart arteries, not to mention the whole host of other causes with everything from high blood pressure or hypertension, valve disease, atrial fibrillation or other rhythm abnormalities. In a group of patients, we just don't know what's gone on, the so-called primary cardiomyopathies, and that's due to a whole sort of inherited or acquired primary muscle problems. It can be related to alcohol, it can be related to lots of other illnesses, myocarditis, and more recently we saw huge spate of this relating to COVID. So next slide, please. Now, the diagnosis of heart failure is a bad one. And um, although we don't want to alarm people, and these are sort of slightly historic data, you'll see that the year there is 2002. And I think although the prognosis from heart failure remains bad, there have been some changes in the last few years that I've talked about. And Dr. Whelan will mention some of these later. But you can see that to, to, you know, without going into absolute specifics, the, 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 the survival or the prognosis for people with heart failure can be as bad as many of the common cancers. And so it's a really serious and important diagnosis, both for people, but also their families and support networks to manage. Next slide, please. And you can see here that the this again is slightly old data, and I'm sure it's probably even higher than that now, but you know, as much as 2% of the entire NHS annual budget is spent on heart failure and its complications. You can see that the vast majority of that is due to people being in hospital. You know, the average length of stay is still around two weeks. 
And so everything that we can do to try to stop people coming into hospital in the first place, and then firstly, getting them home sooner, and thirdly, stopping them then bounce back in a few weeks later is really what a lot of this is all about. And I think not only is it gonna drive huge improvements to the quality of life to patients and their families, but also deliver some well needed cuts, cut, sorry, cuts to the enormous cost in the NHS budget. Next slide, please. So the size of the problem, um, Carol, just interrupt me when um, you're, you take over. I can't quite remember where we were going to take over. Don't, but, uh, don't worry, um, you, you can talk through this slide and then my name will come up. OK, perfect. OK, so I'll just keep going. Sorry, we're, we're, we're doing a bit of a, a joint uh, presentation today and I didn't want to uh, overstep. But I think this is really just kind of summarising the scale of the problem. You can see, you know, the morbidity, the mortality. You can see the increasing incidents as patients get older and they're surviving their more acute illness. You can see the disabling impact it has on quality of life and the enormous expense that's being um, used by the NHS and all the ongoing costs in terms of social care as a result of heart failure. So it's a massive problem and we as a sector and as a hospital have put a huge amount of time, effort and resource into trying to shift the dial of this thing and try to make a better experience for all of us. So I'm going to hand over now to Carol to show some of the really innovative work that she's been doing in the heart failure team. Carol, thank you. Thank you, Tim. So I'm going to be talking about the diagnosis of heart failure and also the treatments that are available to us. And, and Tim's absolutely right that the, the um, slides that he presented um, are um, quite old. However, um, when I was looking at more recent data with respect to the prognosis of heart failure compared to um, other cancers, um, unfortunately, it, it remains, you know, as bad as and worse than many of the common cancers. Um, and although um, the slide looking at um, inpatient stay and the budget, inpatient budget, again, was quite an old slide. Um, unfortunately, still 80% of patients have their first diagnosis of heart failure made as an inpatient. And these patients will have had symptoms before they're admitted to a hospital. Um, and yet they either have been waiting for outpatient appointments or they haven't seen their GP um, or they have presented with symptoms so quickly that they um, felt they needed to go straight to hospital. But I think we can really work on that and, and make the diagnosis earlier. So that's what we've been striving to do um, with um, our work in the heart failure service. Next, next slide. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what heart failure is. Um, Tim has uh, alluded to that in terms of, you know, it's a, a problem with the pumping action of the heart. Um, so what symptoms might one expect? Breathlessness um, is a common symptom for many different conditions, but there is breathlessness that can happen um, when someone lies flat, and that's called orthopnea, or indeed when they are asleep at night and are woken up suddenly by being breathless and gasping for breath, and that's called paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. And orthopnea and PND are specific to heart failure, um, whereas breathlessness per se is not. Um, so it's something that we ask for specifically in clinic. Fatigue is a very common symptom for, again, many conditions, but it is can be the presenting symptom of heart failure. Patients can feel incredibly fatigued, that they just don't have any exercise tolerance at all. And they may notice new swelling of their feet or their ankles or finding it more difficult to get their shoes on. Um, we look to see whether patients have been prescribed diuretics, water tablets to make them pass urine to get rid of fluid. And as um, Tim told us earlier, the most common cause of heart failure is a history of coronary artery disease. So often patients will have had a heart attack in the past. And so we ask about that specifically. We also ask about things like have they had high blood pressure? Are they diabetic? Um, do they have COPD? Have they had exposure to chemotherapy drugs? And as more patients survive cancer um, with the chemotherapy agents, we ask about that too, because some of these chemotherapy agents can in fact cause a problem with the heart function. 
and uh, um, and also with uh, radiotherapy and radiation for for cancer. So how do we diagnose heart failure? Well, actually, it's fairly straightforward. All we need is a blood test and it's called NT Pro BNP and that is released by the heart as a compensatory mediator when it knows, when the heart knows itself that it's under strain. And that um, is there to vasodilate or to open up the heart arteries and other arteries. And so it's produced very cleverly by the heart. And so we can then measure that in the bloodstream, um, very straightforward to, to measure. And then we have a cutoff of what is normal and what is um, what is above normal. What we can say very um, convincingly is that if the NT Pro BNP blood test is normal, that it's highly unlikely that the symptoms that the patient has are due to heart failure. So we call that a very good negative predictive value. If the NT Pro BNP blood test comes back and it's elevated, so again above 300 or 400, then the patient might have heart failure, but that isn't necessarily absolutely the case because other things can put the NT Pro BNP up, such as having a heart rhythm problem, such as atrial fibrillation, or having high blood pressure, or having chronic kidney disease, or having infection, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, if the NT Pro BNP is elevated, then that means that we should go on to do an echocardiogram to look at the overall heart function. Um, and getting access to an echocardiogram um, can be a challenge, but um, we have an open access um, system at the Royal Free so that GPs can um, access echocardiography or they can um, access it through um, referring to one of the cardiology team. And then we have different cutoffs for something called the ejection fraction, which is the amount of blood that is expelled by the heart every time the heart contracts. And these numbers are the, the numbers we look for to see how much the heart is effective, affected by the heart failure. So if the contraction of the heart is affected, we call that reduced ejection fraction. And that number that we use the cutoff for is less than 35. My slides have just gone. Um, and um, if it's mildly reduced, then it's between 35 and 45. And if it's something called heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, then it's greater than 45. The reason this is important is because it can affect which um, medications we're going to use to treat the heart failure. So this is um, an example of the top two uh, slides are of a normal heart. This is an echocardiogram. The slide on the left is looking down through the heart, the left ventricle, the main pumping organ, um, main pumping chamber of the heart, and that is normal. And then on the right hand side, the top right, we can see what we call the four chamber view that we can see um, which is also normal. So there's nice good contraction of the left heart, of the right heart, of the atria, and that's what we want to see. We can then see examples at the bottom of the screen of when it is not normal. And this example is someone looking down through the heart um, with an example of severely impaired left ventricular function. Um, and this patient has what we call HEF-REF or heart failure with reduced ejection fraction um, and the heart is not pumping well at all. So the echo is very helpful in telling us how much the heart is pumping and it's telling us about um, what might be another problem such as the thickness of the heart muscle wall, if the valves are working well, etc. So thankfully we have got good treatments and um, Tim said earlier on that um, the treatments haven't changed much for several years and now we it's a bit like a bus coming along. We've got several all at once and so we've got lots of really good heart failure medications thankfully that we can use and these are definitely impacting on people's lives, on their quality of life 
and making them live longer. So our aims are to improve life expectancy, but really important is to improve the quality of life as well. And the relative importance of these aims do vary between patients and do vary over time. So it's a, an ongoing conversation that we have with patients about their heart failure treatment. On the left, now we don't need to go into detail about what exactly all of these different drugs do, but suffice to say that Previously, we had a very conventional sequencing of heart failure medication so that we would start with one and then increase that up slowly and then go on to start another one and increase up the dose of that slowly and then add another one and then think, OK, well, maybe that's not working. So then we have to add in a different one and change the ACE inhibitor to an ARNI and see if that will help and then add in the SGLT2 inhibitor right at the end. And that whole process could take six months or more by the time we've got the patients back to clinic or written to the GP to help increase the doses, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's a long time. And, and we know that the quicker we get patients on effective drugs, the more likely we're going to impact on that ejection fraction and improve the injection fraction and make patients feel better. And the more recent trials can see that even within four weeks, there's a big difference between the, those patients on the drug and those patients who are not on the drug. And so now we are we talk about the four pillars of heart failure medication. And what we try to do is start all four as quickly as possible. Simultaneously and get some of them at a lower dose on board from the outset and then increase the doses aiming for that to be done within four weeks, so not six months, four weeks. And we know that that will then make a difference because even if we have a small dose of each of the different type of drug that will help, and I'm particularly talking about heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, that having a small amount of each of these drugs is more helpful than just having one of the drugs at a higher dose. Um, so this is a real See change in the way we are treating heart failure. But of course, we need people to make that happen. We need heart failure nurses, specialist nurses. We need heart failure pharmacists, specialists to heart failure as well. We need heart failure specialist consultants. Um, and, you know, we need physiologists to help us with the echoes, to do the echoes, to make the diagnosis. Um, we need nurses in clinic. We need people to take the, the phlebotomist to take the bloods, etc. So, um, you know, we can't. We it's all very well us saying that we want to do this within four weeks, but we need a team. It's a team effort to make that all happen. In addition to pharmacological therapy, there is device therapy, and I'm not going to talk too much in depth about this. But in certain types of heart failure, there are special pacemakers which can actually help the overall heart function improve um, so that the patients may go from having hef ref with that reduced ejection fraction to having um, an, a, a recovered left ventricle and um, a normal ejection fraction and with an improvement in the quality of life and making them live longer. And that's called CRT or cardiac resynchronization therapy. In addition to that, some patients require a defibrillator to protect them against malignant arrhythmias or heart rhythm problems, which require a shock to save the patient's life. So we also assess patients for these devices um, to um, improve life and to save lives. So that's quite a lot of technical information. I want to make it a bit more personal now. And some of you may have remember the heart failure event we did a few years ago before the pandemic. Um, and Abdullah came along with me to speak about his experience with, with heart failure. And so I'm going to just give an update on Abdullah's story with his permission, of course. So when I first met Abdullah, he was a 23 year old engineering student in his final year and he had had breathlessness in the lead up to his finals. It was felt 
that um, his breathlessness might be anxiety related. Um, whilst revising, he thought that perhaps he wasn't exercising enough and so he had reduced exercise tolerance. He was feeling tired because of all the revising, but he was admitted to hospital and he had an anti pro BNP blood test, which was um, significantly elevated and he was found to have symptoms of heart failure, including those important ones, orthopnea and paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. And um, I just wanted to highlight that because in a 23 year old, people don't think that they might have heart failure. And so by asking those specific questions, it became clear um, to the admitting doctor that that's exactly what was going on. And they therefore did the NTPRO BNP blood test, which uh, was elevated and he went on to have an echocardiogram which showed unfortunately that his heart was severely affected and his ejection fraction, so a measure of the amount of blood being expelled, was only 12%. So anything normal is above 55%. So it was only working at a fifth of what it should have. Um, I met him on the coronary care unit and I remember very vividly having a discussion with him about sending him to Harefield for transplant assessment, which is not a conversation you want to be having with a 23 year old. Um, he was transferred to Harefield um, the next day and we feared that he might require either a transplant or advanced treatment with left ventricular assist device, but Thankfully, he did not require advanced heart failure treatment in the means of an assist device or a heart failure or a heart transplant for that matter. He was able to have um, slowly these drugs that I've talked about increased whilst he was an inpatient and he was discharged later that month. And it's five years to the month that this all happened to uh, poor Abdullah. And he was diagnosed with a dilated cardiomyopathy, which means that it wasn't related to the heart arteries, but something that um, he had been, um, uh, it was inherited. So his follow up was then between ourselves and Harefield, and over time we were able to get these important heart failure medications on board, so much so that his NT pro BNP went back to normal and his cardiac MR showed that his heart function had improved significantly. Um, we increased his medication up and we switched him to appropriate medication and he thankfully did not then require a defibrillator because his heart function had improved. He's now on those four pillars of treatment and has been for some time and I saw him last week in clinic and his ejection fraction is now around 45%, so only mildly affected. And even better news is that he's now married and he brought in his four month old, lovely, beautiful baby boy, Az. And Az means someone who is mightier, stronger and more beloved. So that was such a lovely, lovely, um, clinic last week to to see Abdullah and his lovely wife and to meet his four month old son. So really um, just very special indeed. And it's really important that we get patients on these drugs, as I've illustrated hopefully to you, for their quality of life and to make them live longer. And we're audited on this. There's a national heart failure audit and we are looked at to see if we are prescribing the right drugs for patients before they are discharged from hospital. And we can see the impact of these drugs if from this graph you can see patients who were um, discharged. Um, so the black line is those that were in, discharged on one drug. The red line is those who were discharged on two drugs. The green line is if they were discharged on three drugs and the bottom line, the blue line, is if they were discharged on none of those drugs and we can see the survival post discharge is only, is uh, much better in those who were discharged on the three drugs rather than no drugs at all and so the one year mortality rate was 15 percent 
compared to 30% on those without any of the three key drugs that we prescribe before discharge. So it's really important that we are audited on this so that patients get access to the right drugs and we're all doing the same. We're not only just um, audited on the drugs that we prescribe, we are audited on many other things too. And this is taken from the last um, national heart failure audit. So patients are looked to see whether they've had an echocardiogram to diagnose their heart failure. And this has been divided into all patients who are admitted with heart failure across the UK, uh, sorry, across England and Wales, whether they were admitted um, to a cardiology ward or whether they were seen by a heart failure specialist. And so we can see that um, all patients, around 85% of them received an echocardiogram, but more patients got an echocardiogram if they were admitted to the cardiology ward or seen by a special heart failure specialist. More patients receive specialist care if they were seen, admitted to the cardiology ward or seen by a specialist and more patients with HEF-REF, the reduced ejection fraction, were discharged on all of those disease-modifying drugs if they were admitted to the cardiology ward or seen by a specialist. More likely to receive cardiology follow-up, more likely to see a heart failure nurse and have follow-up with them, more likely to see um, be um, referred for cardiac rehabilitation, and I'm pleased to say that we now have at the Royal Free um, Heart Failure, uh, patients can now access uh, cardiac rehabilitation. So um, we're hoping that uh, locally our numbers of patients with heart failure receiving cardiac rehabilitation will go up uh, significantly. And also they are less likely to die in hospital if they are on the cardiology ward and that is very important. So um, I'd like to reassure you that um, at the Barnet, um, both Barnet and the Hampstead sites are audited in all of these parameters and we're above average for every single one. That hasn't always been the case, but the Royal Free London has invested in the heart failure service. And so with appropriate heart failure nurse input, heart failure specialist cardiology consultant input, heart failure pharmacist input, we can make a difference. Um, so that is really exciting. So I'm now going to hand over to my colleague Amit Bakai, who's going to talk more about um, the services that we're providing and how digitising the heart failure pathway has really helped us to achieve what we've managed to achieve so far. Thank you so much, Carol. And um, this has been a, a really nice, uh, elegant demonstration of the complexity of managing people with weakened hearts uh, and more interestingly, all the work that we're doing. Uh, and as you've rightly said already, Carol, that we're, we've been blessed that we're above average uh, and in fact amongst and we'll see why we're above average uh, with the digitization support that we need because managing heart function uh, is, is never easy. Uh, even the detection. So the title is uh, slightly, um, it, it's not managing, it's actually we're going to be finding and sending them home earlier because Carol's already done the managing so well, uh, and particularly the four pillar approach. So if we look at the next slide, uh, before 2019, we had this incredible journey where we all sat as a cardiac team, but also the a &E team, also the nursing staff, the pharmacists, uh, the emergency colleagues and medical colleagues, and actually said, let's look at all the guidelines and what would be the best way uh, for patients to have a journey through heart function at the Royal Free and Barnet and Chase Farm hospitals, and what would be the ideal scenario. And one of the things we recognize is that they often present with new onset breathlessness, or new onset leg swelling. So fluid being retained in the legs, uh, that's particularly something we'll see in the heat where people are drinking a lot more fluid. And then if they're not clearing that fluid from the body, one of the reasons for that can be, uh, one of the commoner reasons can be a weakened heart, not passing that water through to the kidneys to pass out in the urine. And so we sat, we spent 50 hours, Carol and I uh, led these meetings uh, so many times and, and came to the best conclusion that actually if anybody presented to any of our hospitals with new onset breathlessness or leg swelling, why don't we automatically include in their routine bloods 
that NT pro BNP biomarker that Carol's told us about, which is actually a hormone that the heart secretes when it's under strain. So the heart has a sensation of, oh my God, I'm too full. I've got too much blood in the system. Uh, I'm actually overloaded. I must push a diuretic to try and make myself pass more water out. So we actually measure that level and that level actually tells us if it's above normal, it may be because the heart is under strain. Next slide, please. And what happened is that our new electronic system from Cerner came through to Barnet in the first uh, instance in December 19, prior to the pandemic. And we were lucky enough to be the first site in, in not only Europe, but I believe in the world to have a digitized heart function pathway with not only for people diagnosed with heart failure, but people suspected of heart failure. And this is consecutive patients being admitted putting through that data into our pathway, we identify them. The minute the blood test is elevated, they are on the digital pathway electronically without any manual intervention. And so far, because of this pathway, we have over 40,000 patient episode journeys that have gone through that same pathway with the data being collected. And during the pandemic, it became really evident that actually if that blood test marker was elevated, it was also a marker that you may not survive COVID. And we were the first uh, amongst the London group to recognize that as a marker of a poor prognosis, even with COVID, because the strain on the lungs was putting strain on the heart. And we could see that in the blood test marker and the digital pathway. So some of the things that that led to, we even re when the new system at, at the Hampstead site came through as well, the Cerner pathway, immediately the digital pathway was built into it. And on the day of go live, Hampstead patients already had this pathway built into it and we'd modified it and learned some key aspects from Barnet. Next slide will show you the things that we achieved uh, when we did this, this digitization of the suspicion of heart failure. Just trying to press, there we go. One of the things that we found at the Barnet site, immediately when this pathway was switched on, we, our nursing staff, our clinical nurse specialists that and, and told and informed and given awareness of patients suspected to be at heart failure, when the pathway was switched on, every single week thereafter, we went from 29 patients being considered and referred to us with a suspicion of heart failure to 52. Now at the Barnet site already, we've done a lot of work in a &E to try to reach in and find heart function patients. So for us, if this was like, okay, twofold increase, threefold increase, my goodness, will we cope with the manpower? Will we cope with the echo demands, et cetera? So we did a lot of preparation uh, and, and realized that this would be something that would happen uh, also at the Hampstead site. And so we were ready that when we switched this on at the Hampstead site, where we do a lot more angioplasty and stenting, where the focus on Heart function hadn't been there as, as deeply. When we switched this on, we had an increase at that site right up to 59, again, similar numbers from nine. And so we had a four to five fold increase in the number of people suspected with heart function. And fortunately, we were prepared. We'd already got the manpower in place. We'd got the echo services. We'd already got the training in place to cope with this. And we have seen that as a sustained effect. So the pathway immediately allows you to find more patients with heart function. And we'll give you a simple case study straight after this. The other amazing thing we saw is that the pathway nudged people. Uh, we've designed it to nudge people to use those medications that Carol's told you about and to, to change that prognosis that Tim has told you about, the cancer equivalent prognosis. And let's see what that shows you. Here are some of the things that the pathway did in terms of saving lives. It automated the process of echo requests, automated the nudge towards more prescribing. Just struggling to move the slides forward easily, George, I don't know. If, thank you so much. Um, and here on this slide, the gray lines are from that national audit, the NICOR audit, which is 62,000 patients before the pandemic, 2021 data that Carol showed you, the gray lines are where ev average the country is on prescribing these medications. And what you'll see from the blue and orange lines are the two hospital sites, Barnet and Hampstead, now interlinking on exactly those therapies because of a pathway. And on every single class of medications for heart function, beating the national average. And if you look 
Uh, if you look at the second bar, that line goes up to 120. It should only go up to 100. We're already at 95 percent for something called ACE and ARBs. We're already over 95 percent for beta blockers and for MRAs, which are a type of diuretic that help the heart relax and lower blood pressure. The country barely ever gets over 60 percent. And on both hospital sites, we're at 70 percent. To do this on every single drug class, the probability is so low, it has to be a real effect uh, of our pathway. Next slide. And we've already shown um, that we're reducing mortality. And a simple case study, here is an example of a 60-year-old lady who came to casualty. Uh, she was a, a, a dinner school, a school dinner lady. Uh, she'd been told that much of her breathlessness was anxiety, much of her breathlessness was asthma because she'd been wheezing. Uh, and the CT scan when she came to casualty did show some lung disease and it was thought she might have a respiratory problem and she was given a respiratory outpatient. But because of the automated pathway, the number being over 2000, immediately our nursing teams picked her up, arranged an echocardiogram within eight days. This was managed. No intervention for the GP to do anything. No intervention for the patient to do anything. Our digital pathway nudged our nurses to arrange an echocardiogram. The echocardiography physiologist at the Barnet site saw and detected this heart function and the valve across the heart is really tight. It wasn't opening properly. There's a big lump of calcium sitting in the middle there at three o'clock in that top picture. And that was stopping the heart valve opening so she couldn't get blood out, even though the heart was strong and trying to beat really hard. Even just being told this information as she reached A&E, &E, um, she actually, her anxiety kicked in and she actually passed out. She actually collapsed. She had a cardiac arrest and we were fortunate enough to be able to resuscitate her, speak to our cardiac surgeon colleagues at Bart's and we transferred her overnight. And a few days later, she had that valve replacement. So from being told uh, she had anxiety, asthma, respiratory problems, the pathway actually brought to our attention the valve disease uh, that was so bad that that anxiety episode alone uh, caused her to have a cardiac arrest. Like, and this is just one of many stories. And this, and because of this wonderful pathway and the guidelines and the optimization we can do, we were able to do more. We created a virtual ward where we're able to discharge people early and look after them. And we have consultant colleagues like Dr. Amaral now who are looking after patients virtually. 40 to 50 patients any one time. We're discharging them earlier and they're being looked after for the next 18 days. We were also having a diuresis lounge for some patients that just needed to be here for a day to get diuretics and they sit in an armchair and then they go to the toilet back and forth and pee out uh, the fluids with an injection. So, so many different innovations. But the most interesting innovation is, of course, that for research studies that are coming along, we have a ready made group of patients for the next level of optimization. And so we've been able to put patients into newer research studies on newer medications, uh, thanks to the pathway work that Carol, others, and many of us have participated in, in bringing to the front, forefront. And so we are now sharing this work with our other partners and Cerner, uh, our electronic record system, is really keen uh, this is integrated into all of their Cerner pathways in the future. So this is the sort of things that we've been doing. Uh, we've been pre emanating or, or uh, trying to do preventative work by finding people upstream even before the diagnosis and then managing after the, the inpatient stay where we get them on all the right medications to allow them to go home earlier. But Carol, I'm going to hand back to you to say the bigger picture of how we're connecting this all up across the region, if that's OK. Thanks, Amit. Um... So yes, with the, having the heart failure hub at the centre of um, our heart failure service, we can then um, have patients come to us who have been admitted to hospital and then discharged. So we then see them early in their post discharge to help prevent them being readmitted to hospital. We can see them if they've attended ED and rather than um, go home to then have the GP have to refer them back to the hospital because they might have heart failure. We're picking up that anti poor BMP result and arranging to see them urgently to have a one stop shop in the heart failure, uh, heart failure hub where we can do an echocardiogram at the same time as the consultation and then get them started on these drugs that are so important. We're then working with 
um, our GPs in the community and our community heart failure nurses to um, identify patients who are at risk of heart failure and asking them whether they may have one of those symptoms such as breathlessness, fatigue or new swelling of ankles and if so um, resp them responding to a text if they're in an increased risk group um, they respond to a text and then we arrange for them to have an NTPO BNP blood test. If that's elevated, then they get an echocardiogram and review by one of the consultants in the heart failure hub. So we're screening at risk patients, trying to identify them earlier on so that they're not being admitted to hospital in acute heart failure. We're also looking at patients who um, are known to have heart failure, who for one reason or another haven't been able to come up to the hospital because they've not wanted to come into the main hospital because of COVID um, or they, they haven't come for their appointment or they've had telephone appointments and haven't been seen face to face. And this heart failure hub and they're all free is separate to the main entrance to the hospital. And so the patients are feeling more comfortable going into that space and so they can be seen and have a, a, um, data collected as part of a heart failure mass clinic and then we can look to see are they on the right drugs, are they on the four pillars that we were talking about earlier, um, should they be getting a device um, and looking at their um, where they are with their heart failure journey, are they needing input from palliative care um, for example, um, are they need, needing help with social prescribing? So looking at all these different aspects um, and it's so the heart failure hub being central to that, uh, working with community, working with local GPs and working with palliative care to make sure that the right patient is being seen in the right place at the right time. And if you could just go back a slide, please. We can see from our sort of one team approach um, some call it integrated. We want to be seen as one team that it, we're, we're not having to integrate care. Um, we're all, all just one team working together with GPs and community teams that when we did our mass clinic, we looked in um, with our pilot, we found that 40% of patients had a heart failure medication change, that 12% had a new or updated um, care plan, 7% um, were referred for a device um, consideration, and some of the patients who are known to have had HEF-REF heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, their up-to-date echo had shown that their heart failure had recovered. Didn't mean to say that we would stop the medication, of course, but the great news for the patient that they were um, had recovered heart function as a result of their medication. So th it may be that as we go forward that this might be um, a more effective way of looking after heart failure patients across the community, um, having MDTs to discuss all the patients with the GPs. And since then, I find that more GPs are contacting me directly to ask advice or speak about medication changes, etc. So, so that relationship um, is improving all the time. And you can see this word cloud, which Rachel Brady, who I have to say has been amazing in helping us with all of this. Um, she did this word cloud and um, it's quite small, but you can see there that patients were feeling worried, anxious, nervous before coming to the Heart Failure Hub. And afterwards they were feeling good, feeling calm, feeling reassured, feeling happy. So that was really positive feedback from our patients, which of course is absolutely central to everything that we do. So if you just then go on. So um, we've been able to celebrate the work we've been doing with recent Oscars um, and the work done for digitising the heart failure pathway came out top in the outstanding contribution to research category um, and the heart failure clinical practice group across site was also nominated in recognition of the fantastic work that everybody is doing. Um, I mean, mentioned clinical research and clearly everything that we do has been driven by clinical research, uh, patients participating in trials, allowing us to see what drugs work, what, do works do, what drugs don't work, what devices work, what we should be doing for patients. Should we be starting um, medications all at once? Should we be only starting once at a time? All of that, has, all of that information is evidence based through clinical trials. And of course, there may be some of you um, listening in this evening who might want to take part in 
clinical research and therefore the um, email address is, is here for you. And indeed, some of you may wish to consider helping us with our heart failure pathway and being involved and sort of as a patient advisor um, so that we're getting it right. We do look for feedback, as you can see from our patients, making sure that what we're doing um, is impacting in a positive way. This is us taken um, when the Marlborough Clinic um, opened for the first time in 2021. Um, and it already feels dated, thankfully, in terms of having the masks on. Um, but uh, yes, we we're certainly um, have space there, so patients do feel more comfortable. They're not in a very um, busy outpatient um, uh, area, and uh, so it does feel a bit more calm and relaxed in the heart failure hub. So we're now going to move on for the last 10 minutes to a, a question and answer session. Um, we have got a, a few questions already. So Amit and, and uh, Tim. Um, and also I'd like to um, introduce Alison, who thankfully has made it on um, with us. Um, Alison, thank you very much for joining us um, uh, this evening um, for this um, heart failure um, session. So um, there are a few questions which hopefully we have answered. Um, what is the definition of heart failure? I think we've we've answered that. Um, can atrial fibrillation lead to heart failure? Um, I think we've we've answered that that heart rhythm problems can lead to heart failure. Um, is shortness of breath? <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> is shortness of breath and mild chest pain always a sign of heart failure? Amit, maybe you could answer that while I take a sip of water. Yeah, of course, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, not not always. We can have things like clots on the lung that can cause shortness of breath and ch a sharper chest chest pain. And we have different blood tests. <laughs> if you've just come off a airplane flight, for example, in the last couple of weeks, and you suddenly get short of breath with chest pain, we will do something called a D-dimer to to see if you might have a clot on the lung. Uh, and then there were a couple of tests about the NT ProVNP. Uh, if you want, uh, Carol, I can just quickly nip that one off. The, the NT ProBNP blood test can be um, lower than suspected, and if it's low, doesn't mean you haven't got heart failure. 98% of the time, it is accurate that you don't have heart failure if it's in the normal range, but there are people who are at high body mass index, so people with a, a lot of subcutaneous fat, uh, and so then the, the NT ProBNP level is artificially lowered. Afro-Caribbean origin colleagues, patients and people will also have a, a falsely lower nt B, so the range needs to be adjusted. And then people who are already on medication such as water tablets or taking a lot of caffeine drinks and so forth, which can also be diuretic. So those things can lower spuriously the nt B, and then accidentally higher any chest infection, anything that causes strain on the lungs will also cause strain on the heart. But that doesn't mean the heart is failing. It could be a temporary strain. And so you can have a false positive uh, with chest infections, clots on the lung with a heart attack, not meaning that the heart is weakened, but transiently it's under strain. Uh, if we do a procedure such as an operation, coronary artery bypass grafting or a cardioversion, those sorts of things will also elevate that blood test, but the antibrobium B will come back down when the heart has recovered. Thank you. So I think you're just illustrating that if someone, um, the GP suspects that the patient has heart failure and it's not quite fitting because the antibrobium B is low, that they should still seek advice and see whether their patient might fit into that um, less common category where the antibrobium B is low, but they do actually have heart failure. Um, this is very um, uh, appropriate question to be asking given the, the current weather. Should patients be advised to reduce or omit diuretics during the extremely hot day periods? It's a really good question, isn't it? And the answer to that is um, one of the things that you and I have always done with patients, Carol, is said that please look at the colour of your urine. And if you have three dark urines in a row, you are at risk of getting dehydrated. And so you either need to be drinking a little bit, another extra half a litre that day, or as you rightly say, if you've been educated and advised by our cardiac research nurses who are very good at helping you, you can flex the dose of the diuretics 
if you believe that you're at risk of getting dehydrated. But the education that our team give on looking at the colour of the urine. So we say three dark urines in a row and you may be at risk of getting dehydrated. So either call us, contact your heart function nurse, uh, et cetera, or please uh, drink an extra half a litre or you might drop a half a dose of a diuretic like fruzamide or bumetanide. You might lower the dose in this heat, but you're absolutely right. People have been getting low blood pressure and dehydrated um, because they have, they're on diuretics. It's a great topical question. Thank you. Um, and a, another a, a theme from some of the questions, um, is, are there any screening pro programmes for people with a family history of heart failure? Yeah, Tim, do you want to did you want to take that one or Carol, you, you probably want to talk about Gabby's work even even more closely. You know that than I do, I expect. Yeah, so um, Gabby Kapter is um, one of our consultant colleagues who um, runs the cardiomyopathy um, service at the Royal Free. So cardiomyopathy can be inherited and uh, so she runs a screening programme for um, patients and for their relatives to look to see if they have any genetic um, type of heart failure uh, and screens the family members as well. So uh, she's a very welcome addition to our heart failure team um, and uh, does very specialised work with uh, cardiomyopathy patients. So yes, there, so it's, in short answer is yes, there, there are screening programmes um, for certain types of, of heart failure. So one of the um, questions that's come up, um, um, we are asked about the cost to perform NT-ProBNP um, and the extra cost per year for screening with the NT-ProBNP in A&E. Um, and um, going back to your slide, Amit, comparing um, referral rates at Barnet and the Royal Free, the referral rates were higher, considerably higher at Barnet pre-EPR being switched on than the Royal Free and people may have wondered why that was. Well, before um, the EPR was switched on, the turnaround time for the nt -pro BNP at Barnet was in a couple of hours. So the blood test result was available to the ED doctors to then refer the patient on. Whereas at the Royal Free, it was taking at least two days to come back. So not helpful for the ED doctors. And so that coincided with then EPR and with the pandemic and, you know, the pandemic caused lots of problems, but we did manage to switch on a much quicker turnaround for the nt -pro BNP results and hence you sort of starting to see that increase in referral rates. But really it was the EPR that provided that fantastic, um, you know, referral rates uh, to the numbers that we have now. So uh, I guess one... the answer we we might want to give is that um, it, the nt -pro BNP blood test cost is certainly much lower than someone being admitted with heart failure. Um, and uh, but maybe I, I should let you answer that. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you so much, Carol. But first of all, we were we were the first site ever from Abbott uh, to be able to have nt -pro BNP. Uh, sorry, BNP. Uh, this was in 2014 uh, in the country. And, and so we were the first to even make it available to our primary care colleagues that they could actually request a BNP. And so we have 10 years of experience, even before the pathway was uh, 10 years of experience on BNP and NT pro BNP testing. And so we'd actually done, uh, we'd actually undertaken a lot of research on the health economic benefits on the selected patients that you suspect heart failure of having that diagnosis early and actually be able to focus where the echo went. So. It's a great sophisticated question about the return on investment, the health economic benefits. It's not a screening tool generalised. It's a screening tool specified by the symptoms. We were very careful, weren't we, Carol, when we said actually not everybody gets an antibiotic MP because there'll be so many things that will pick up as false positive that it should be new onset breathlessness or new onset bilateral leg swelling. And that stood us in good stead. And, and so the return on investment there is, is worthwhile. Well, I think we might be drawing to a close. Um, if you do have any additional questions, then you can send these to rf.membership at nhs.net um, and over to Alison. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Carol, and thank you to uh, to Tim and, and Amit also as our speakers for a fascinating set of presentations and discussion this evening. And thank you to all the attendees who have joined us this evening online. Um, if you want to contact the Council of Governors who uh, run these sessions, please email uh, our governor inbox and the uh, the email yeah the emails just come up there so you feel free to uh, to email that um, that uh, governor's mailbox and uh, it just leaves me to say thank you very much for everyone to joining us and i look forward to the next session thanks very much thank you